Hello. Today I am here with Dr. Amanda DeCero. She's a board certified OBGYN and is currently working at Hill Country OBGYN in Austin, Texas. Hi. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks for coming today. Yeah. yeah. So talk about some fun stuff. Yeah. And uh, if for the people that could see the video, um, I'm wearing a shirt that says take a hike. And then Amanda's wearing one with a uterus with the middle finger. <laughs> it's great. I love it. I love it. So we'll just go ahead and dive right in. So today we're going to talk about HPV yeah, and, yeah. and all that. So I know there's a lot of questions that people have just because there's not a ton of education on it. I mean, I know in my pelvic floor training, it was touched on, but not to the depth that obviously, you know, as right. the OBGYN. So. Right. And it's one thing that we see, it's super common, see it every day. And despite it, you know, having vaccine being around for a long time, we haven't seen really a decrease um, in overall like cases with, with women. So it is important to kind of educate. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it definitely is. So, okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to dive into a question we have from Kelly. Okay. She's 35 years old mm -hmm. and she's from the Bay area. She writes, hi, Dr. Mary. I was recently diagnosed with HPV and I'm really worried about how I contracted it and if it will affect me having kids. Can you explain the virus to me and what the typical treatments are? Sure. Um, it's a great question, especially involving fertility and kids, I get that question a lot. Um, HPV, it's a virus. It's extremely common. If you are sexually active, 80% of people will come in contact with it at some point in their life. And it actually might even be higher than that. It is transmitted sexually, but it's not what I would say. It's a little bit different from like a sexually transmitted infection that we think with like gonorrhea, chlamydia. So if you do have it, I don't want you to start pointing fingers at your last partner because the thing with HPV is it can lay dormant. It, you can clear it and it can be totally gone. You can get reinfected with it. It can persist. There's a bunch of different things that it likes to do. So it's different from person to person. It, you just don't ever want to, you know, people love to point fingers at their last partner, but it could be something that you've had previously for a long period of time. It is transmitted sexually. I like to blame men as I do for a lot of things. <laughs> Um, as the reason for transmission. Yeah. And the thing that's kind of interesting is that even though men are the ones that give it to women or other men, the only approved testing for HPV in the U.S. is a pap smear for a woman. So you can't have men just go out and get tested for it. Yeah. Ugh. That's like <laughs> just a little heartbreaking inside hearing that. Yeah. But, you know, yeah, I mean... It's just interesting to think, you know, with other STDs, it's like, okay, if it happens within X amount of time since your mm -hmm. last partner, but uh, understanding that, hey, this could have been something, this could have been your first partner. Right. And then you start experiencing it, right. you know, 10, sometimes 10 years later. Is right. That so yeah, it can be dormant. And then we're basically, when we're doing pap smears, we're catching it in a period of time. And our goal for that is we, we want to reduce you having like severe disease related to it. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing your routine screening, it, it's really good to prevent getting to that point. Usually when there's severe disease, it's people who haven't been getting screened or tested for, you know, 10 plus years. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I think, I mean, from my perspective, it seems like people go in and get their pap smears, but they're not really sure what what's really happening. Right. You know? Right. So I think the other thing is um, when you go to your OBGYN, when you're getting a pelvic exam, that's different from a pap smear. Because I know when people will sometimes mention like, oh, I had a pap smear when I went to the ER. Well, they didn't do a pap smear. They probably just did a pelvic exam yeah. um, for whatever the issue may be. But a pap smear is actually when we take either a little, we call it a broom or a brush, and scrape some of the cells off the cervix. And what that is doing is screening for the, we can do both the HPV virus also to see if there's any cell changes. Mm -hmm. And you can also just do one or the other. It just depends on from physician to physician what their their routine screening is so yeah that's that's the different than us actually just doing a pelvic okay so then so when you get a pap so you're getting both an hpv test and you're testing the cervix for abnormal changes right like i wish it was that easy <laughs> <laughs> but actually yeah um it's kind of it's age-based also it depends on your history okay so current guidelines if you're under 21, you do not need a pap smear. That being said, if you have a history, if you are um, positive for HIV, that would be one reason you do under 21. Otherwise, even if you're sexually active, doesn't matter, 21 no matter what. Why is that? Because we found like 15 to 21 is when a lot of people start becoming sexually active. And so in that, that's when you're being infected a lot with HPV. And so we were having a lot of abnormal paps and doing a lot of just unnecessary treatments 
Whereas if we just wait until 21, a lot of times it will clear up on its own. Gotcha. Yeah. So now it's 21. 21 to 30, we actually only screen for cells, mostly because that is a high risk for HPV in that population. And so we kind of assume that you probably have HPV. I mean, we just want to make sure your cells are okay. Gotcha. Now, after 30, if it's persistent with the HPV, then we have to start being a little bit more, um, a little bit more aggressive in, in that if it's not being cleared or if it's still present, we want to make sure that it doesn't progress. Gotcha. Okay. So, because I feel like there's just so much misinformation right. about this out there. So when people look it up, they're like, what is this? You know, what's going on? Right. You know, right. all the testing. So basically... Okay, so so that's kind of the testing for it. So right. can you explain? And that's assuming you have a normal pap smear. But I know it gets really confusing. In fact, they have an app for us because <laughs> it's so confusing <laughs> where we have to like put the age in what your last two paps were and if they were yeah. normal, abnormal, and then it just because it, it just gets to be confusing. Where a lot of OBs, they'll just typically just do it yearly because A, people prefer that. And then also it's just sometimes it's not going to hurt anything, essentially. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think also, too, I've had clients and friends and stuff where their pap came back abnormal and they lost. They were yeah. very scared. Just because it's abnormal doesn't necessarily mean, it's right? It's cervical cancer. Right. Yes. Right. Okay. Can you explain that a bit? And th no, that's a, a really good point. Whenever I have someone come in um, and they do have an abnormal pap and we're having to do a, a further testing, and the first thing I say is, is this is not cervical cancer. Yeah. Our goal is basically to look at the cells of the cervix to ensure that they're not going to progress that direction because it's really one of those things now if you didn't if you had an abnormal pap in 10 years time not everyone's going to have cervical cancer but some could and so our goal is basically to prevent that gotcha. so it's just basically cells that could lead to that over time and it's not just the cervix i should say you could also get hpv infections basically anywhere in the genital or anal region so that could be your vulva that could be um vaginal changes, cervix, and also around the anus too. So it's all prone to getting it. There's also now an increase in um, um, HPV infections in like the tonsils and the throat. Really? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's a, that one's becoming a little bit more prevalent too. Um, and that again is not something you can routinely test for either. Well, how would it demonstrate in, in men or people with penises? <sighs> Typically it'll present with like warts. Usually by the time something's found, it's cancerous in like the throat. It's not something that's like, oh, I have this problem. And then over time it leads to, it's usually like a cancer and then they screen it and it's typically caused by HPV. Gotcha. So, and that's, that's in the throat. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so generally, you know, we were kind of talking about this earlier. Mm -hmm. There's not an FDA, you said there's not an FDA approved test to see if men have it. Right. And so that's why it can be hard. I mean, you can get so in a routine STD test, you're not getting an HPV. Right. Like if the blood tests and stuff right. and the P tests and all that. The only way to screen would be with a pap smear. Yeah. I said P test. <laughs> that's a medical term, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that's important too because yeah. people will say, oh, you know, my STD test is is, you know, they didn't find anything, uh, you know, right, wrong. And it's like, well, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that HPV is is not Correct. there. Uh, why is why is that? We just can't test in blood. Is yeah. That yeah. 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 But and then the other thing, too, is, you know, I think using protection, especially mm -hmm. if you're, you know, if you're ha having multiple partners or even with you know, somebody new yeah. having these conversations, but also understanding that even using a condom, right, right. does not prevent it's, HPV. And I think that's right. important for people to understand. It's super, it is, I highly encourage it because it's the best way to reduce your risk of it, but it's a skin to skin contact. It's just yeah. like with other viruses, like with warts too. But so if you happen to have warts in your, you know, an area um, where your skin is touching during intercourse, like that could be affected with the HPV virus. So it's definitely going to reduce that chances. For sure, yeah. Um, but it's still always a small chance that you can get that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Obviously, yeah, still using protection mm -hmm. when you're not sure about, uh, you know, yeah. whatever yeah. works for you. But really understanding, you know, what that means. So that still means get your screening, right. even though you've been using condoms for right. protection. Right. Um, so that's that's important. And so 
So, right. Okay. So going back, so there's no FDA approved tests for men. And then the main test that we have. Okay. So so let's go through like the steps, right? So somebody comes in and they do the pap smear, Mm -hmm. right? So they go in, they do the pap smear, pap smear comes back abnormal, Mm -hmm. but that doesn't, what does that mean when it comes back abnormal? There's another, a little caveat to the abnormal testing. So there's a bunch of HPV viruses, (laughs) Lots. So oh, we really? have, okay. we have, there's a few that are more um, likely to lead to cancers. We have, we clump them into two groups. So you have the high risk group and then the non high risk group. Mm-hmm. So if you have a non high risk group, you can just repeat your pap in year. Mm-hmm. If you have a high risk group, then the next step is to actually do, we call it colposcopy, which is a fancy word for me looking at your cervix with a microscope. Okay. And what that does is it lets me see the cells they put like a vinegar on it it's literally like white vinegar is what it do you bring like. like vinegar from home you're <laughs> no. like hey guys but it smells some just money. like white vinegar <laughs> <laughs> and what's interesting is the cells will light up a certain they'll turn white if oh. there's anything abnormal with it you know so um and then we do biopsies of that area because that's going to be more diagnostic because a pap smear yeah. is just kind of a like a screen. Right, right. Yeah, screen. it's not like so a di- not diagnostic. Not, I see. Okay, so then, okay, so you go in and you see nothing. Mm-hmm. So then you're like, okay, you're good. Mm-hmm. Come back next year. Right. And then, so say you see something. Biopsy. Okay. And then depending on what that is, it's either I'll see in a year or the next step would be if it's something more severe, we, we call it high grade, um, mm-hmm. then we do an excisional procedure. And that, depending on which excisional procedure, depends on where the area is, too. Okay. Can you explain, so that precision, that would be like a leap? Right. Okay. Right. There's a leap, and then there's also a cold knife cone or a CKC, but... um, Can you explain those, too? Yeah. So the leap, um, typically, everyone's different, depending on where you practice. We, um, I typically do it in the office. The longest part of the thing is numbing up the cervix and looking at it. The actual leap itself takes 10 seconds. It's very quick. Oh, yeah. (laughs) So it's the whole process of getting it all set up. Um, But what it is is it's um, it's a hot little – I can't think of what it's actually – it's a little loop, and it goes up to the cervix, and then it excises those abnormal cells, with the goal being we're removing those cells that are are abnormal and infected in hopes that you – it'll clear up whatever it is. The cone we do in the operating room, and that one is going to be a lot dependent on if you've had a leap before, if the abnormality is higher up into the cervix. So the cervix looks like a donut. Yeah. And so you can only see here. I cannot see on the inside of it. So if there's anything inside that we scrape that's abnormal, the cone can get up there a little bit higher. Oh. But it's basically, it's just we use an actual knife to cut off. And it's a bigger uh, excision usually with that okay yeah so that's the cone Mm -hmm. and then with the leap how is that different it's gonna be more shallow okay and it 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 won't go as deep yeah so it excises it it just depends on where it is how how can you tell yeah how would you okay so when you're doing the colposcopy Mm -hmm. it's hard for me to say i know I'm like, so when you take a piece of it, you know, yeah. like, it's not. Yeah. Um, so with that, so how would that, how can you determine from that if you can't see inside the cervix then? Right. So we have a little brush or a little um, curatage that scrapes. To, that's how we screen during the colposcopy. So if I can't see anything, I'm like, everything on the outside looks great, but I can't tell you what's going on inside. I will do a little scrape of the inside. Oh. And, and if that the, comes back abnormal. Then, then you do the cone. Yeah, you, sometimes you. Okay, it's very dependent. There's <laughs> a like, lot of like. <laughs> you're like, it's not so clear cut. It's not. That's why I wanted to talk about this. Yeah. It's so like, it's just when I when I have conversations with people, they're like, I don't know. Mm-hmm. It's just it is what it is, and it's like, but the more information we know about our bodies, the right. better you right. can kind of advocate for yourself and understand like right. what what you know what's right. going on. One thing, um, by the way, I forgot to answer about the fertility. It doesn't affect fertility. You okay. can have babies. But what about like like the procedures might affect fertilities, right? Well, it, they could per- affect because if you think about it, we're for removing part of the cervix that could lead to cervical length shortening is what we would call that. That could potentially be a risk factor for preterm birth. So that's where it's preterm labor to preterm birth. I have a ton yeah. of patients who have leaps though that go full term to pregnancy without yeah. any issues. I have patients who've never had a, a, anything done to their cervix and they have a short cervix. Gotcha. So it's not like. 
yes, you will have it, you know, but it's, it's definitely a risk factor. Actually, HPV can affect the, um, the cell matrix or the, how the cells are in the cervix, which that is also a risk factor for cervical link shortening. So, gotcha. so let's explain that a little bit. Okay. okay. So for the anatomy, we have the vagina, mm -hmm. which is a tube, mm -hmm. the end of the tube, you've got the donut, mm -hmm. which is the cervix mm -hmm. and, and then after the cervix and we've got it's the like uterus. the mouth of the uterus yeah it's the, the cervix the guardian of the <laughs> galaxies right. of the uterine yeah. galaxies yeah um and so yeah so when you're pregnant you want to make sure like you know like That's you said the, like yeah the door sh shutting or the mouth closing to make sure that baby doesn't come out yeah and so that's the you said like you said the leap so if somebody were to have that's why they'd probably be careful about doing multiple leaps. Is that right. fair to say? Right. And and you can, so that is a thing. You can have multiple leaps. Um, and even with a cone, typically we, we do a routine. When you're pregnant, we screen everybody for cervical length shortening mm -hmm. at a certain gestation. If you have more risk factors for it, though, that screening kind of continues a little bit longer during pregnancy just to make sure. For sure, um, yeah. But there are times where if I've had to do, someone's had a leap, I've had to do a cone, and I know their cervix is short. I tell them when they're pregnant, they're probably going to need a little stitch to keep it closed during the pregnancy just to be safe. Just to be safe. Yeah. yeah. So if somebody's had a leap and they're pregnant, is penetrative sex okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it Sorry, I, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I wouldn't do a leap if they're pregnant, but I get what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no. I was yeah. saying if they've had the history of yeah. it and then they, they go in, yeah. it's okay unless they're having, like, what are some symptoms of? cervical insufficiency usually um like painless spotting okay that also though can mean i mean it's common to have spotting during pregnancy with intercourse so it doesn't mean that that's what's happening but I think that's, that's important to note because yeah people immediately think that they're having right a miscarriage right and so it's it's a lower chance but typically the the first symptom you get but I'd actually say that it's usually asymptomatic. It's usually caught during an ultrasound when we do their screening. Gotcha. Because we do that at about 20 weeks. And so everyone, they'll, they'll screen for cervical length shortening, and that's usually when they'll see it. Okay. So it's usually asymptomatic, actually. Gotcha. How do mm. they test for it? With uh, ultrasound. Got like mm -hmm. a vaginal ultrasound? They start on the top, transabdominal. And if okay. it's below, if they're like, ooh, this looks short. Okay. Then they do um, the cervical or the vaginal. Just to kind of talk about like, I know there's like different phases. We're diving more into birth a little bit, so we can kind of <laughs> retract a bit, which is so hard because like when we're talking about vaginal health, cervix, yeah, yeah. all this stuff, it's so easy to kind of dive into yeah, yeah, yeah. more of that stuff, which we could probably do a whole other podcast. I know. I was like, I could, uh, yeah. On that. But um, okay. And so you, we talked about, you know, HPV, how it's diagnosed. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, what does it mean when you're diagnosed? I feel like when there's any form of STD, there's still the stigma is improving, but mm -hmm. I feel like there's there's just still this kind of fear or like shame or like some scarlet letter and right. it's like you know so many people are getting exposed to different viruses like even like herpes type one mm -hmm. what is the percentage of people that have that a ton it's like i think it's like 90 <laughs> and actually one and two because people have oral sex so you can't distinguish the two yeah. at all so yeah. it's just like you either have a cold sore on the mouth or the vagina it's super and some people yeah. have had exposure to it but i've never ever had an outbreak yeah so it's the numbers are probably higher than what we even know. Yeah. And but it's it, something like, probably I think it was like 70% the last day. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. Yeah. People aren't talking about oh, no. it. Because it's like, oh, no, no, no. There's something, you know, it's, it's interesting. I feel like people are, from a healthcare perspective, it's, is it fair to say that HPV is technically more risk to your health than herpes? Yeah. And what's interesting to me is more people are open about, about HPV, HPV oh, yeah. but not herpes. Yeah. And it's like. Herpes is like. People, they what? think it's a Why death sentence. Why is there sentence. that stigma? I don't know. Because <laughs> it's they're like it's for life. I'm like, well, HPV could potentially be that be for too. For life too. But yeah. HPV can cause cancer. But yeah, HPV Herpes has is a just huge a, like stigma. stigma. Yeah, and it's like it's I know it's unfortunate. Yeah, and but, the, and yeah, and and there's like this assumption that oh, if you get HPV, it just means you just slept with a lot of people. It's like, well, if you want to sleep with a lot of people, do what you got to do. But also like, don't shame people right for right. wanting to have. Yeah. The sex life they enjoy. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And and it doesn't take a lot of people either. Like that's the thing with HPV. It could be one partner your mm -hmm. whole life and then boom. Yeah. 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 No, I think it's it's just pretty 
interesting to kind of talk about these yeah. things just because I don't really see them openly talked about. Right. I would say probably HPV is my discussions in the office. I have HPV is, yeah, it's for people. It seems less scary to them than like HSV. Yeah. Which is always. I think that's interesting, right? Because mm-hmm. it's more of that kind of, mm-hmm. what's the word? Stigma. Right. Yeah. Well, I guess HPV though, because we do have the vaccine, which. Um, oh, yeah, let's chat about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the vaccine, it's been around for, gosh, a while now. It's I think it super came out effective. When I was like in, I don't know, 17 or something. It was, so yeah. Like 20, 2002? Probably sooner than 2000? that. Okay. But it's been around for a while. And it's um, there's different types. The most recent one covers more HPV viruses, up to nine. Which um, one's the most recent one? It's still like the Gardasil, but it's a nine versus like, I think it used oh. to be four. So, so they're, be like, okay. I think it's important for people to know that because yeah. I think like, oh, I had the HPV vaccine, so I'm not at risk. Right. With no vaccine is 100%. Right. But this one's like the goal of the vaccine is not for you not to get HPV necessarily, but yeah. to prevent you from having a severe disease from it. I think that's really so important. So we're for preventing to know. like cancer of anogenital genital area. Mm-hmm. So that's and oropharyngeal because that one's also harder to detect. So that's really the goal because you can still get HPV with the vaccine. Mm-hmm. It's going to be more effective as far as like clearing it out sooner or preventing your cells from going to the point where we're worried about a cancer. Yeah. So and it's unfortunately like I think only the more recent statistics, like 40 to 50% of people that have it, that it should be much higher than that. That, what do you mean? Like that have, like, it's only, it's not very high as far as like how many people have the vaccine. Well, I think there's just not a ton of education on it. And then what has been mind blowing to me is just like how many people don't know that younger boys should be getting Mm -hmm. it too. Mm -hmm. And you know, why are we not talking about that? Yeah. Yeah. And so what are the ages? Is it the same ages for men and women? Yeah. So you could technically do it as like nine is the earliest I believe you can do it, but you Usually around 11, 12 is when pediatricians are the ones that should be recommending it um, or family physicians who see kids of that age. And it used to be really only approved for up to age 26. Well, recently they decided that's silly. Let's move it up to age 45 because there are, everyone's different. So it's different if you've been in like, say you're in, you have the same partner for 20 years and you're 35 and you've never had an abnormal pap smear and you never had the vaccine. Do you need it? Probably not. You're probably yeah. fine. But say you're not in a monogamous relationship, mm-hmm. um, have never had the vaccine, then yes, it, I would totally recommend it. Mm-hmm. So it's nice that it's now up to age 45 because before when it's up to 26, it's like. <laughs> yeah. Well, I also think it's important too that like, it's not just penis, vagina, genital right. contact. It's any, any, right. any relationship that you're in. Because I feel like that might be something that people think. Like, oh, just because I, you know, have, I don't have a male partner, mm-hmm. you know, that I may not need it. And it's like, well, there's still that risk, right? Yeah. More so it's men. It's a, any relationship with a male. Okay. <laughs> it's just like. <laughs> Start <diverged. right> there. <laughs> it always goes back there. When in doubt. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think that that's important. Why mm-hmm. did they change it though? Like, was there a study, you know, what? I think it has to do with like insurance covering it. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Cause before it didn't get covered after 26 and now they're covering it. But I think it's because oh my gosh. they, I God. think the rate of cancers were like, especially I think it was more oropharyngeal stuff was going up. The previous recommendation was because that was up to age 26 was that common time where you see the HPV infection. Well, we know now that that's, I mean, people are having intercourse all the time and why does it have to be only up to age 26 maybe people aren't having intercourse until they're 30 and then they have just like 10 partners like like, sex stops at 27 right right. so (laughs) i think it's just just give up right yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) no i mean that's that's really and if you have had it in the past and you're over 26 and you you're like oh let me get another vaccine you don't need to. The one that you had is super effective. It's doing what it needs to do. So yeah. you don't have to get revaccinated. Yeah. We don't recommend that. Yeah. No, like like we were just saying, I think it's important for people to understand like what's being tested, you know, like your, or like what it's actually protecting against, mm-hmm. right? Because I think for some reason when the assumption is like when you get a vaccine, it's like, oh, I'm never getting it again. It's like, well, that's not no. necessary. It's like to keep you alive. Right. It's to prevent like the most serious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, and if you've had HPV and you've not had the vaccine, you can still get the vaccine. Like that's not a reason not to. And you don't have to be tested for it prior to getting it. So you just, oh, okay. it doesn't matter. Yeah. Gotcha. It doesn't matter if you've had it, if you've 
never had it you've never been eat, do you yeah we still recommend it yeah mm -hmm. so what are who are people that are more likely to like when they have a lower immune system right, right. so is it hiv mm -hmm. maybe cancer treatment mm -hmm. um autoimmune diseases would you say if they're on some sort of immunosuppression for okay. like autoimmune or inflammatory bowel disease that sort of thing yeah the, the, yeah it's harder for your body to clear a virus out also, tobacco, cigarettes, huge risk factor for yeah. persistence of HPV, which could lead to cervical cancer. What about drinking alcohol? No, I think it's just smoking, actually. Okay. Have your last wine. It's okay. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not I know. I know. I know. Whatever you need to do. But I'm just like, okay. Just the, <laughs> with in moderation. But no. No, actually, it's been mostly with tobacco because it gets to the cells where the HPV affects. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow. So you're at higher risk for cancer. Okay. And so... How how do you know if somebody has HPV in the mouth or tonsils? It's typically discovered after they already have cancer. Oh. Yeah. So there's you no can't, like, screen, screen. But you can't use, like, the same one that you use in your... Mm -mm. I mean, maybe. You could reuse it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you That's probably gross. actually could. And I know... No, I'm joking. Like, no, I, <laughs> not reuse it, but you probably could use that. I mean, technically, I guess you could screen for HPV. Um, but I do know there are um, some... I've heard some physicians do, like, for... Um, uh, like doing like anal paps on men before that's yeah oh yeah why aren't we doing that i think you can i think it's just one of those like it's not approved but you can do you know yeah but there's things in medicine just, that i know yeah. but that's why it's so important that we talk about these things so people can kind of know right mm -hmm. and so you know recently is it the american gynecological mm -hmm. obstetrics What's the it, it, oh AFOC? yeah okay. American like, College of Obstetrics and yes. Gynecology? Sorry, I'm like, I can't say <laughs> big words. Um, ACOG for short. ACOG. Yeah. Okay, so ACOG um, came out and said what every three years now for it is that for the pap? Yeah, it depends. Okay, <laughs> so, it's not very black and well. They're trying to make it like a, a black and white, but it's not. There's like a lot of nuances. And so that's why we have that app because it can be very confusing. Yeah. So I mean, I'm it the depends person... on the testing, the age, what your prior paps were. Yeah. Yeah. I think just for me personally, having a history of cancer, I'm at, right. you know, I get it once a year yeah. just because I'm at risk for every cancer. Right. <laughs> yes. And I always tell my patients what the recommendations and if they're like, I want a yearly pap, I'm fine to do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's and not going to hurt anything. Well, that's also important too, because if you're asking for it and your provider's like, no, yeah. how do you handle that? Find another I guess, doctor? Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, it's... And just know like if you've had a normal history, I that's the other thing. The reason we come up with these guidelines is because... Your chances of getting a cancer in three years if you have a negative pap smear is like almost zero. So it's mm -hmm. more of like cost effectiveness and not having to do like such frequent testing. Because sure, in between you may have HPV, but then the next year may be negative. So it's just a transient yeah, thing. Of, well, kind of what you're saying, if you're in a monogamous relationship and right. you tested negative and you know, then you're, you're likely okay to wait three years versus right. like if you're dating and, or you mm -hmm. have a, a lower immune system, it's probably right. more like, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. That makes yeah. sense. What app is this? Is oh, it only yeah. for you guys? ASCCP. It's, ASCCP. yeah. Okay. Well, it's funny. They, they, yeah, they recently, it was not recent, I guess. I, I was using it for a while and then I realized when you update it, you actually had to pay for it. And there was like all of this new stuff. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> like, yeah. I think it's just important for people to know that like healthcare is not black and white. It's not. It is, it is not at all. And it's, it's, it's an art almost. It's mm -hmm. an art based on education, the patient in front of you, right? your experience and then research. Right. And so it's, I think for me, being a pelvic floor physical therapist, one of the biggest things that I find people say is just that they're not feeling hurt, right, in, right. in healthcare. And so just making sure that, yeah, like you said, if, if you're, like you said, if somebody's coming in and they're like, I would like a pap smear, okay, like right. there's a reason why that person wants it. It might help with their anxiety. Right, right. Right? Like it might help. Does not hurt. It does not hurt anything, so... Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it, it, I also, it's like insurance still pays for it if you have insurance. So eventually, cool. hopefully they won't ever change that, but you never know. Yeah, yeah, hopefully. Well, so we talked a lot about HPV. So in that, we, you know, we answered uh, a lot of the questions that Kelly had, Yeah. you know, or Kelly's question about it. And so generally speaking, you know, we talked about 
what HPV is, what it causes risk for. So, you know, and then the testing for it, the vaccine, mm-hmm. um, how you can contract it, contract it, yeah. contract it, yeah. contract it. <laughs> I'm just laughing because it's like a contract. <laughs> Anyways. Um, so then, and then we talked a little bit about herpes. So like, what are some other common STDs or facts about STDs that people are always kind of mind blown when they see you and they talk to you about it? That to, in order to have an STD, you have to have symptoms. Yeah. You do not. Yeah. In fact, I tell everyone to get their yearly report card if you're sexually active, um, yeah. because most things can be extremely silent. Chlamydia being the the biggest one that we as women I think think about because that does kind of play a role in fertility because it can affect that. How's that? How's so that, like what are well let's go yeah. what are chlamydia symptoms and then how would that right? So chlamydia is um, symptoms honestly mostly usually asymptomatic, but you can have like bleeding after intercourse, mm. pelvic pain, an abnormal discharge, but usually it's asymptomatic. And what it can do is it loves to spread up through the cervix, through the uterus, into the tubes. And cause a lot of inflammation, which can lead to tube or uh, scarring of the tubes, which then can lead to infertility. Mm. Um, and if your tubes are no good, then that's IVF. Like that's usually how it's treated. So I think that's really important that people, if they're like, oh, I don't have any issues. I, I don't know. I always encourage a yearly STD screen. Oh, always. Uh, even more yeah. often if you're seeing multiple Right. People. That or if you're in a field where you're around a lot of needles and blood, like healthcare, I also like doing like HIV and hep C and that sort of thing. So yeah, I always encourage that. Now with the STD screen, this is where it's very different from doctor to doctor, but I do not include HSV testing in my A lot of people are stopping to do that because Because, it's freaking people out. Exactly. And it doesn't tell me anything. And it's just like, what do you do with this information? Why do we even have that test? So wait, that's herpes. Okay. So type one and two. Yeah. So some people will routinely screen it. Well, if you've never had an outbreak, but then you test positive for one of the herpes viruses, then what do you do with that information if you've never had an outbreak? And then you're anxious, do I tell you're partners? You're anxious, and then you start telling all these people, and then it's like, well, what if you don't have it? Right. So what is the gold standard for herpes? So if you have a lesion, come in, and we can culture it. What's a lesion? Sorry, I'm just like, no, yeah, yeah. For, so, so they can kind it's of identify. a painful blister, cut, swelling. It's huge. It's pretty painful, and it's it's not something that goes away like the next day. Like it's Mm. typically lasts a few days, but it's usually like painful blisters or like painful little cuts. Gotcha. Um, And sometimes you can feel like kind of like a, just feeling like run down, like you are Mm. sick. Um, Sometimes you can feel lymph nodes in the groin, but usually it's just like very painful blistering or cuts. And so one of the things to do to test for that is do a culture, but do blood testing at that time can be helpful to kind of say, is this something that you've had or is this a new new thing? Not that that matters a ton because it's all the same, but um, for treatment. But yeah, that's that's what I recommend. So I tell my patients when I do STD screening, I do not check for HSV unless they unless specifically or want asking. it. If they ask for it, I'll do it. And I just tell them, this is why I don't usually do it. Yeah. The information. It freaks people out. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then it's a... And, and, you know, yeah, you weigh the pros and the cons, right? It's like, okay, well, you right. show up positive, but that doesn't mean you have it. Right. You know, what it, do you... But know? also, it's like HSV 1 and 2, people have oral sex, so it doesn't matter. Well, you can have HSV 1 on the genitals, HSV 2 orally. It doesn't really mm-hmm. matter. So then there's also the stigma that HSV 2 is like the one that with the genitals and HSV 1 is the cold sore. Well, it's they not. Switch, yeah. yeah. So it doesn't... That doesn't also like distinguish one from the other. Well, so, so yeah. So herpes would be the sores and then HPV would be the genital warts. Right. Correct. Okay. Because I think when people shave the area and stuff, they're like... They they get a bump and they're it's just like oh no right and yeah so, it's not usually herpes if it's a bump it's yeah. it's typically like a flat or it's an ulceration a blister yeah it's a a raised bump is 99.9 percent of the time never herpes gotcha that's a, that's yeah. huge yeah yeah that's important i think for people to know and what does would you say if if you have hpv what do those warts typically look like like warts like warts <laughs> Okay, so we just got worse, but are they in clusters? Is it a single one? Like it can it can be all types. It can look like cauliflower. It can be a like, tiny little skin like tag rainbow, appearance, or it's like a snowflakes. Not all, <laughs> right. not all, oh. right. Warts. And a lot of times too, like it's sometimes if it's like, is this a skin tag or a wart? I don't know. I remove it and send it and we'll see. <laughs> like, yeah. But sometimes warty appearances, they just look like warts. They look like tiny little pieces of cauliflower or larger pieces. So it just gotcha. depends on how significant and severe the, the warts are. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Anything else that we haven't kind of chatted about you see often? No. 
I think the HPV is a good one that we talked about. And then also, yeah, screening for at least gonorrhea chlamydia is always good, I think, just because it's yeah. you're usually asymptomatic. Yeah. I feel like we could talk about STDs for another mm-hmm. hour or so. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you yeah. so much for coming yeah. on. Yeah. Is there a place that uh, they could follow you, like Hill Country, OBGYN? Yeah. Um, I don't have... Yeah, so, yeah, Hill Country OBGYN is our um, office. It's H C O B G Y N. You can uh-huh. follow them on yeah. Insta. Yeah, not me though. <laughs> you don't have a personal no. one. No, I know mine's like a private your personal. Private one for your your babies. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Oh, thanks and, for having me. Um, yeah, awesome. This was fun. Thank you so much. All right.